Hello and good afternoon. I hope you guys are having a great Sunday and uh, well, let's get started, shall we? And so in today's message, we're going to continue on the series of Take Your Place. And this is part three. And today we're going to be talking about awakening the church or church awakening. How last week we compared the church to a lioness and we're going to continue kind of along those lines. And remember in Revelations that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he's the lamb that was slain. And so the church being Jesus's bride, that makes us the lioness. And so we covered a lot of that last week and the week before. Uh, if you missed those messages, they are available on YouTube. I would suggest uh, you can go watch them if you are interested on YouTube and our channel is Imprint International. So you can find those there. And then uh, today we're going to continue on the lioness. And so a common experience most of us may have in seeing a lion is at a zoo. The lions at the zoo seem to me like they are slightly sedated or drowsy all the time. Part of that's because they sleep during the daytime and that's when we go see them in the zoo. And the other part of that is because uh, maybe they're bored with their surroundings or the, the captive lions are different from a, a wild lion. And so let's go to that instance with me, if you will. You're watching a lion and the lion is asleep. The lioness is asleep. When they are asleep, you can get really close to them, running the risk that they wake up, of course, but you can get really close to them and their, their guard is down. So the enemies can come up to them and maybe they're in a little bit of danger when they're sleeping. Uh, sometimes the church is also like that. Sometimes the church has fallen asleep and the enemy can get really close and he can cause harm to the church because the church is asleep. They're not fully awake. A lion can be sitting there relaxing, kind of zoned out so to speak, they're kind of tranquil or maybe you can see their eyes moving, but they're kind of tranquilized, so to speak. And, and there's no harm when they're tranquilized. If you're ever around a lion after it's gotten the dart in it with the sedation medicine and then it falls down and is asleep or its eyes are open and it's watching you, but it's unable to react to you. So it's tranquilized. The church is also, sometimes we're like that. We're in a state of tranquilization where we are watching the world around us, but for some reason, the church is unable to react to the world around us. And so we're gonna talk about some things that make the church asleep, make us tranquilized or sedated. And we're gonna talk about some things, some ways for the church that they can waken up and begin to react to the world around them. And so some of this, we're actually gonna dive down and we're gonna figure out maybe it's an individual case and it's not just all about the church, but it's also about you as an individual in the body of Christ. And so we're gonna be looking at uh, some of those things today. When the lion is fully awake, the lion or lioness, they are powerful, they're strong, they're fierce, they're graceful, they're fast, they can be loving and caring towards their young. And, and so the lion's got a lot of different character traits. But when they're fully awake, they're powerful and they're strong. And that's how we think of a lion is powerful, strong, strength, might. We think of things like that. When people think of the church, what comes to mind? Are you thinking the church is powerful? Is the church strong? Does the church have their authority? Are the, is the church the king of its territory? Because that's what the lion is. But when you think of the church, is the church weak? Is the church shut off from the rest of the world? Is it isolated? How do you think of the church? Is it graceful? Is it loving? Is it welcoming? Is it fierce? How do you think of the church? When the church is fully awake, the church should know what is rightfully hers. 
The church should walk in its authority that we have as we're seated in the right place of the hand of God next to Jesus. The church should have its power over spiritual forces. The church should know what its calling is. It should be walking out its purpose. The source of her wisdom and strength comes from God. It does not come from its members. The enemy cannot overtake a fully awake church. The, the enemy of the lions cannot overtake a fully awake lion. The enemy has to wait for the lioness to fall asleep. You see, see where I'm going here. The enemy, Satan, he has to wait for the church to fall asleep before he can wreak havoc on the church. He has to wait before the members start to fall asleep before he can start attacking the members of the church. He has to wait for the leaders to fall asleep before he can attack the church. So the enemy, he's waiting for us to fall asleep. The enemy is waiting for us to be tranquilized to our surroundings and for us to be sedated so that we don't know what's happening around us or so that we're not fully aware of what's happening around us. The enemy wants us to be in a non-reactive state. Is that where the church is at today? It's time for the church to wake up. It's time for the church to arise to its purpose. We need to remember who we are and who is behind us. Jesus Christ is behind us. We have his authority and his power backing us in our actions today. We all have a commission to go and make disciples of all mankind. We all have a purpose and a part to play in this commission. Some of us are not thriving, we're just surviving. We're just barely making it from day to day. We're so busy and we're so tired at night when we come home that we don't have time to connect with our purpose or our calling. Some of us are sedated and we think that we'll never get there. Some people are tranquilized and they're watching everything fall apart around them, but they're unable to do anything about it because they think that they are not powerful enough. Our power doesn't come from us, it comes from the Most High. We learned that last week in the book of Isaiah. God gives us our power through the Holy Spirit. God gives us our authority through Jesus Christ. We alone are not powerful enough, but we are with Him. Anything that we can do, it's not on our own strength or might, it's because of Him. It's because of Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace and we are made righteous through Jesus Christ. We are called to be the light in a dark place. Are you the light? If somebody has a broken heart or somebody's going through some kind of tragedy, can they come to you for help? Or are you somebody that they don't want to come to? Do they run in the other direction? Evil is all around us. Evil is around our friends and our families, and evil is slowly taking ground. We need to defend our territory, church. We need to reach out to those around us. We need to reach our families and our friends with the gospel and the good news that Jesus Christ came to deliver us. We need to share him with all the people we come in contact with by being that loving, kind Christian that we are called to be. But we also need to make disciples. We need to train people up in the way that the Bible says a Christian should live. So it's not just being loving and graceful and kind and gentle. It's also about being that Christian that has that authority. Sometimes we have to be rough. Sometimes we need the rough edges because it helps to make us better. Sometimes we have to be mean or we have to react in anger. Jesus reacted in anger when the temple turned into a den of thieves or a den of robbers. He, he tore down the, flipped over the tables and he took the cord from the drapes and started whipping it around to clean out the temple. Jesus was angry, but he was angry with a purpose. The Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. And so when we're angry, we have to be careful. Check your actions, check your motives, make sure you're acting the way God wants you to and do not sin. But it's okay to be angry. Sometimes anger fuels that passion inside of you and it drives you in a positive way. 
So we know that God is backing us in this season. God is with you where you are right now. So if you are tranquilized and you're unable to react to the stuff that's happening and you're just letting things happen to you, it's time to wake up and take action. Don't just let stuff happen to you. Don't just let the evil surround you, but wake up and walk in your God-given authority. Be grounded in the word. Get in prayer. Talk to your heavenly father. Read your Bible. Talk to your Christian friends and get godly advice. That's okay. That means you're waking up. That means you're not going to sway to and fro and just let things happen to you. God wants the church to wake up up. He wants us to arise and take hold of our purpose and go do good. That's what God wants. But sometimes doing good is not the same as being good. There's a difference there and we're going to take a look at that later. Maybe you're one that thinks I'm rooted and I'm grounded, but I'm exhausted. Maybe it's because you're rooted and you're grounded, but the enemy is throwing distraction after distraction after distraction after distraction, and he's keeping you busy, and he is not letting you get that rest that you need so that you can fully pursue your purpose. Maybe you're one that's thinking, I'm rooted, but maybe you feel like your foundation is slipping, and for you, it's time to get back into the Word. Some of you, you've heard messages like this, and you're numb. You can't feel it anymore. You've, you've shut off that part of your body and you've become numb. Some of you, you're walking in a sin and you know who you are. And, and, and because of that sin, your heart is closed, it's numb, and it's hard. And even though God is speaking to you, because of that hardness, you can't hear him. Okay, so it's time for us to get back into the word and to begin to grow those roots down again so that we can wake up and have action, so that we can be alert and, and react to the environment around us the way God has called us to. We need to go from surviving to thriving. We need to get from where we're blind or oblivious to what's going on around us and, and that we're aware of what God is trying to do in you, through you, and around you. Because God is trying to do something inside of you. He's trying to do something through you. He's trying to do something to the people around you. But we need to get into that state where we can receive that and we can open up and let it go through us to the people around us. The word gives us very clear warnings that the church needs to wake up. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 to 17, I'm going to read the Amplified this week. He says, for this reason, he says, awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine as dawn upon you and give you light. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as the wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people making the very most of your time on earth and recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence. Because the days are filled with evil, therefore do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Now, if we break this down, I want you to see that Awake sleeper. Sleeper is talking to the believer. He's not speaking to the unbeliever. Awake sleeper. Awake Christian. Awake believer. Be aware of what's around you. Wake up. Stop sinning. Wake up. Arise from the dead. Some of us when we're in a sinful state, iniquity, where we keep going back to the same sin over and over and over again, and you've gotten to the point where you don't even repent anymore, you don't even seek forgiveness, God is saying, awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead. Stop chasing after that sin. Stop going back 
to that sin. Stop numbing your heart to the call of God and begin to wake up and arise from the dead. Stop going down the path that leads to death and begin going on the path that leads to life. That's what verse 14 is talking about. It's not to the unbeliever. It's for the believers. Arise from the dead. It's a wake-up call for the church. That's what this verse is saying. And Christ will shine on you as dawn upon you and give you light. And then in verse 15, it says, And Christ will shine on you as dawn upon you and give you light. Here is where it's talking about how Christians need to walk in love and be kind to each other. But that's not to say that we're always just, Oh, I love you. No matter what you do, I love you. You can always just keep coming back. No, that's not what he's saying here. When you walk in love, sometimes the people that you love have to discipline you or you have to discipline them, right? Your parents love you. How many of you, when you acted up as a child, your, your parents said, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you as they began to spank you? I hated that line. I never made sense of that line. But now that I'm older, it actually makes sense because your parents they love you so much that they hate to see you in pain, but they have to cause pain so that you remember that what you did was wrong. So it hurts me more than it hurts you is a line that they use because them, your parents, when they see you hurt, it hurts them. So when they have to be the one to cause that pain, it hurts them more to cause that pain, then it actually hurts you. And when we understand that, discipline comes from love. Discipline does not come from hate. So when we love one another, that also means that we have to correct our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we all can go walk in a holy way. Walking in love does not always mean just love. But sometimes it means that there's a little bit of discipline or sometimes love is messy and people get hurt and that's okay. That's love. We're humans. We all make mistakes. And Paul, in the rest of this passage, Paul is actually, he's, he's speaking out of love to the church about the sins that they're doing and about how they're chasing after the wrong things. And if he doesn't speak these things out in love, then how else can they be received? And so the rest of this is a little harsh but it, it's actually really good for us. The, the passage continues on. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living with honor, purpose, courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil. He's not talking about shunning those that we're called to reach. He's talking about within the church. Sometimes you have to shun those that are non-repentant. They don't want to change their ways and they want to keep hurting people. Those are the kind of people that we're, we're being told to shun. They're the ones that are tolerating and enabling evil. And if you tolerate them, then you're opening yourself up for that evil to come into your, into your life. And you don't want that. But I like the way Paul continues on as he says that we are not to be unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people. So that means you can't shun every sinner. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that we need to shun certain sinners, certain kinds of people, but we have to be wise and discerning as to who's harmful to us and who we can help. Okay. So that he's not telling us that we can't go out to reach the lost. He's not telling us that we can't hang out where the lost people hang out. He's telling us that we need to go and bring them in to the church. But for those people that are non-repentant, for the people that refuse to change, for the ones that are constantly going back to the same mess and they're bringing that mess into your life, those are the ones that this is telling you to shun. He's telling you to put them away so that you can make the most of your time 
and that you can be able to recognize and take advantage of each opportunity. If you're so busy dodging somebody else's drama, it's taking you away from your calling. Okay, some people are really good about always having crises. Those people could be taking you away from your calling. Most of you know that Pastor Sean used to work for a lady and she always had a crisis. Something was always wrong. She would contact him day, night, weekend, weekday, work time, sleeping time, morning time, night time, didn't matter. She was always like, it's emergent, answer me so much. And, and, and these kind of people, they're actually a distraction. They're, they're not the kind of people that God wants you to be hooked up with because they actually cause more drama, more stress, and they take away your peace. You have no peace because you never know. Every time the phone goes off, you don't know if it's your boss and you don't know what kind of havoc she's going to put into your life again. And so that's the kind of people here that God doesn't want you to be distracted with. And so by shunning that, pushing that out of your life, that opens you up so that you can recognize and take advantage of each opportunity. Because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, don't be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. So don't be foolish and thoughtless means don't waste your time. Now here, he's not saying you can't have fun. He's not saying that it all has to be great commission, great commission, great commission, great commission, great commission. No, that's not what he's saying. You have to be able to have fun. You have to be able to relate to people because how can you reach people if you're in a little bubble? To reach people, you have to relate to people. I had an instructor in college say, it doesn't matter how much you care, if the people cannot see that you care, they cannot receive your message. So you have to show your caring before you can ever be heard. So you have to be able to relate to people in order for people to understand what it is that you're trying to give them. But at the same time, be on purpose with your life and don't forget about the Great Commission. Don't get locked into so many situations that you forget and that you're thoughtless with your time. And pursue God. Have that quiet time. Fill up your heart with His Word so that you can also know what the will of the Lord is for you because each one of us have different gifts and talents. Maybe your gift is to be the MC. Maybe your gift is to be the audio tech. Maybe your gift is to be the camera guy or the singer or the musician. We all have different gifts and talents. Maybe your gift is to be the greeter or a small group leader. Maybe your gift is just simply an IT guy. Maybe your gift is just simply to make beautiful web designs. Maybe we all have different gifts. We all have different talents. Some of us are seen and some of us are unseen. But God gave you those talents because there's something that you can do for the kingdom of God with your talent. There's something that you enjoy doing that you can use to reach people. And so God's will for me may be different than his will for you, but the will of God is all the same. The will of God is to reach all people groups in all the world and make disciples of men. But the how is where we each come in and we each have our unique purposes and callings. There's another warning in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Do this knowing that this is a critical time it is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep of spiritual complacency. How many of us are complacent? Let's go back to that lion at the zoo. If we go back to the lion at the zoo, the lion is complacent, right? They're in the same containment area. 
They get fed food that's strung up and handed to them. They no longer hunt. They no longer do what they're designed to do. And they're stuck in this cage where people are constantly watching them and everything they do is on, on, on for show. It's all visible to the public. And so the lion becomes complacent. The lion begins to not care about things that they used to care about. And the lion is almost kind of in a sedative state or a complacent state. And how many Christians are like that? We feel like if we do something that we're going to be judged for it, or you feel like you're going to be sued for it because it violates human rights, or you feel like something is wrong, and you feel like all these political issues and these new laws, you feel like you're in a cage and you're not able to freely do what you want to do, so therefore you become complacent. Paul wrote this, okay? Paul was a guy who was arrested, beaten, and he, he's still writing this. Wake up from your sleep of spiritual complacency. For our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in Christ. The night, this present evil age, is almost gone and the day of Christ's return is almost here. So let us fling away the works of darkness and put on the full armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly and honorably as the light of day not in carousing and drunkenness. And then it goes on. Okay, and so here, the warning is to wake up. Remember that Christ is coming back and the time is coming closer now than what it was yesterday of Christ's return. And so we need to wake up and conduct ourselves properly and honorably so that when Christ come back, we can be received to him. And so these passages, they're very clear that we need to awaken from our numbness, that we need to awaken from being sedated. We need to awaken from being tranquilized. Don't be numb to the problems in the world around you today. Everybody's hearing about Afghanistan right now. Don't be numb to the situation there. Don't be numb to the persecution in the other countries. Don't be numb to your situation where you are today. Just because Afghanistan is making the news as the number one place for persecution today, tomorrow, it could be your place. Everybody has a harvest field. And that time is running out. The time is coming when you will not have time to save the people around you. You need to live your life on purpose because tomorrow is not a guarantee. We need to awaken from our sins. We need to awaken from our numbness and we need to stop saying somebody else is going to do it. It's not my job. It's not my calling. It's that calling. They need to do it. We need to wake up and take what we have and do what we can where we are. We need to stop putting it off on other people. If God gave you a calling, if God gave you a passion, you need to wake up and figure out what is step number one. How can I start this? What can I do first? And if your dream is bigger than your imagination, then that's great. Get in the word, get in prayer, figure out what is step one. Start somewhere. The mouse eats the elephant one bite at a time. An elephant is so big. Some of our dreams are so big. We don't even know where to begin, so we don't. But God is saying, hey, you have my power and my strength and my resources available to you. But you're not accessing them. You're not using them. Why? Why? Why is it all going to waste? Why are people dying and going to hell? You have a purpose. You have a calling. Wake up. Start somewhere. 
Just start. Stop waiting for somebody else. Stop dreaming that this isn't really happening. This is all just a dream and I'm really just doing what I'm supposed to do. Get out of your comfort zone and start somewhere. The church needs to be tenacious enough to stand up for those who cannot. We should each pursue our purpose and continue to seek after God and figure out what, what his will for our lives are.